My name is Sharon. I'm a 35-year-old housewife. My husband, Taylor, is the same age, and we've been married for five years. We both used to work, but I quit my job when I gave birth to our first child. We've been blessed with two children and we're living a happy life, but the company my husband was working for went bankrupt. We did receive unemployment benefits, but they weren't enough to cover our living expenses, and we had to use our savings. Taylor found a job after a while, but his salary isn't enough to maintain our previous standard of living, and we're barely managing to get by. I've been wanting to get back to work, but I've been struggling to find a job. During interviews, they always express concern about me not having a backup child care plan in case of emergencies, since my parents live out of state. I also can't work while my children are still in their gradual entry period at daycare, and that's also been another problem. The local city hall told me that I could get my kids into daycare even while job hunting. But once I tried, it turned out that getting daycare slots for kids under three was far harder than I had expected. For one, priority is given to people who are already working, so as someone who isn't working, I couldn't even get into the first round of applications in August. By the time I was finally eligible to apply in the second round, the classes for my daughter's age group were already full. In the end, no slots were left and I still haven't managed to secure daycare. Our oldest child, Gary, started attending kindergarten this year. I was told that he could join the class for three-year-olds without needing approval from the city hall. Our younger child is a girl, and she'll start kindergarten next year. Until then, I plan to work part-time. One day, Taylor, who was at work, texted me saying, I'm stopping by my parents' house before I come home. Taylor's father had passed away early, and his older sister, Betty, had left home after she got married. So now his mother and his younger sister, Tina, are the only ones back home. Occasionally, they do ask Taylor for help with labor-intensive work, like moving furniture around for redecorating or helping carry heavy stuff from the home improvement store. I assumed that they needed his help again that day. However, Taylor, who usually comes home by 8 p.m., even when he stops by his parents' house after work, didn't come home as early that day. Daddy is late today. He promised to play Lego with me today. Yeah, Gary, why don't we all play Legos together, including your little sister, Mina? So I took care of the kids by myself while waiting for Taylor to come home. Taylor finally came home after the kids were fast asleep. When I heard the front door unlock and went to greet him, I saw Betty and Tina with him, both carrying large luggages. Long time no see, Sharon. We're going to stay here for a while. Hey, Taylor, where should we put away our stuff? My sister-in-law, Betty and Tina, nonchalantly asked. I was taken aback, but couldn't turn them away at such a late hour. For now, I let them into our living room. As soon as they set their stuff down with a thud, they sank into the couch, started watching TV, and playing with their phones. They were chilling in my living room like it was their own place. I gently nudged my husband Taylor's back, pushing him to another room to figure out what was happening. Hey, you didn't tell me Betty and Tina were staying over. Sorry, sorry, it all happened so suddenly. Don't just apologize, I need an explanation of what's going on. It's a long story, but it seems Betty had a fight with her husband and went back home, which got our mother mad. Tina tried to mediate, but that only made my mother angrier, and they both got kicked out. I could kind of picture what had happened. My mother-in-law was always stressing about Tina being jobless, so this incident was probably her last straw. So, this is all because of Betty's quarrel with her husband and your mother's fight with your sisters? Once things cool down, Betty and Tina will go back, right? Um, about that. I decided to let Betty and Tina move in with us. They'll be living with us from today. What? You can't just do that without talking to me about it first. We're barely getting by with the four of us to begin with. How are we supposed to provide for two more people? We don't have the money or the room for it. I know, but I can't just leave Betty and Tina with nowhere to go. We can clear up the kids' room, and we'll figure out the money situation somehow, okay? Please. And that's how we ended up living with my sister-in-law. They never seemed to be looking for a job and didn't help with housework or look after the kids. My workload at home increased, and I constantly had to be mindful of their presence. 
I was dressed out. Betty was always out and about. Often she'd return in a bad mood, but occasionally she'd bring back some goodies. Gary, I'm in a good mood today, so I got you this. Wow, I always wanted this lightsaber. Thank you, Aunt Betty. My son was delighted, but I was conflicted. Betty, I'm sorry. We only give toys as presents from Santa Claus on Christmas and on birthdays. We can't accept such expensive gifts. What's the big deal? I want it playing slots. Take it. I'm in a good mood and want you all to feel the same. You're such a bummer. From what I learned from Taylor, Betty spends most of her time at slot parlors. Her gambling was the reason for her fights with her husband and, by extension, my mother-in-law. Perhaps because of Betty's influence, she'd give toys and candies on a whim or lash out when she was in a bad mood. My son seemed to be becoming more selfish. I was worried that Betty was negatively influencing my son and daughter. On the other hand, Tina, who's unemployed, claims to be an aspiring YouTuber. Tina, my other sister-in-law, is always loud, singing and dancing without being mindful of our neighbors. Hey, Tina, this isn't like your mom's house where you lived before. We're living in an apartment. Can you please stop with all the noise? What? Did someone complain? Not yet, but we might get complaints any day now. We need to be considerate of others here. Why should I stop when no one is complaining? I'm an aspiring artist, so I need to practice and stream. Gary and Mina's crying is much more annoying. You should do something about that instead of coming for me. No matter how much I warn her, she never listens. Soon, we started receiving complaints from neighbors like, Please stop blasting loud music. Please don't sing at night. And, We understand the kids making noise, but we'd like adults to keep it quiet. Tina was being loud today as well. I knocked on her door, but she didn't respond. Being left with no choice, I opened the door. Tina, I told you already to stop making noise. I've got complaints from our neighbors now. Then Tina glared at me. How dare you interrupt me while I'm streaming? But Tina, don't call my name, just leave. My daughter Mina, startled by Tina's yelling, started crying. Ugh, oh, you guys are the loud ones here. Please make her shut up. All I could do was try to calm down my sobbing daughter. Even though I'm the one who has to apologize for the complaints, Tina neither improves her behavior nor shows any signs of remorse, leaving me at my wit's end. When Mina finally fell asleep from crying, the intercom rang. I opened the door, dreading another complaint, but this time it was a mailman. The package, which seemed to be from an online shop I've never heard of, was for Tina. Although I couldn't open it, I was curious about what she had bought. It turned out to be from some expensive brand. The feminine dress Tina often wears seems to be from the same brand. While I'm unable to afford much for myself, I felt sick to find out that my jobless sister-in-law was spending a fortune on clothes. If my sister-in-law continued to splurge like this, there's no way we can make ends meet. Since my husband, Taylor, is the one giving the money, I grew concerned and decided to talk to him. Don't you think Betty and Tina are spending too much? Gambling and buying expensive dresses, where's all this money coming from? They're not borrowing from sketchy places like loan sharks, are they? Don't worry, don't worry. They're not borrowing money from such places, and I can handle our finances. Just stop worrying. Taylor insisted everything was okay and seemed to be arranging money from somewhere. To be honest, I was hoping that my sister-in-law would go back to their parents' home soon, but I was enduring the situation for now. And so, one day, about a month after I started living with my sister-in-law, I got a text from a friend from high school that she had a baby, and I decided to gift her some money for my personal savings. Before I got married, I lived at my parents' home and was able to save up about $4 million, including my bonuses, which I had originally intended to use for my wedding. However, my mother told me, Don't use the money you saved before you got married. It's important to have some in case for an emergency. So I left it untouched. Although I was saving it for building our own house in the future, I wanted to spend some money for my friend's celebration. Even though we were financially struggling, I couldn't just not gift her anything, so I decided to withdraw a little amount from my savings. 
but I just couldn't find my debit card, which I thought I had kept safe with me. For a moment, I thought it might have been stolen, but my passbook and seal are still there, so it didn't seem like a thief had ran through our place. I thought I must have misplaced it myself, so I decided to search for my debit card later and in the meantime, go to the nearest ATM and withdraw some money using my passbook. When you make a passbook withdrawal, it automatically records it, but the passbook didn't come out for a while and it kept printing something. As the machine noise went on and on, I started to get a bad feeling. Finally, the recording finished and as I suspected, my balance had decreased and there was only about half of the original amount left. When I checked the withdrawal history, I could see that the money had been withdrawn several times after my sister-in-law arrived. Seeing that, I was sure it was my husband Taylor's doing. Since the money was originally intended for our wedding fund, of course Taylor knew about my savings. I had the same pin for all my bank accounts, and there was a time when I told Taylor the pin so that he could withdraw some money from a different bank account shortly after I gave birth to my child. I guess he must have remembered the pin I told him then. I reached my limit when I found out that Taylor was covering the living expenses of my sister-in-law with my savings and decided to consult a lawyer. The lawyer told me, It's hard to take legal action because theft among relatives is exempted. However, all savings before marriage are personal assets, so you can recover the depleted savings separately from the property division and alimony when you get divorced. He said the bank could suspend my debit card, so I called them and they were very helpful and immediately put a stop to it. I told my parents about this, that I couldn't go on with Taylor, and that I was firm in my decision to divorce. My parents seemed incredulous about what Taylor and his sisters had done. Even so, they said, if you're going to get divorced and come back, we'll always welcome you, which I found very reassuring. Next, I called Taylor's family. I'm having trouble because Tina and Betty came to my house, and with Taylor, they're doing whatever they like. I'm getting complaints from the neighbors about Tina's band practice, and it's poorly affecting my children as well. Even though we're financially struggling, Taylor is giving money to Betty and Tina, and I found out that they were using my personal savings from before I got married. Hearing my words, Taylor's mother sighed deeply. After not hearing from them for a while, I thought they were doing well, only to hear this. I'm really sorry about all this. They are truly a hopeless bunch. It's my fault for raising them this way. You can kick those three out right away, and I'll make sure they repay you for the money they've taken. No, it's not your fault, mother-in-law. I'll get the money back from Taylor himself. Can you keep this a secret for a while? I understand. However, can I tell Betty's husband about this? Apparently, they had an argument over Betty's gambling habit, which is why she moved back in with me and now her husband keeps contacting me. Agreeing to my mother-in-law's suggestion, she informs Betty's husband about her whereabouts and the situation. Betty's husband then wanted to hear the story directly from me, so he arranged a phone call during his break. I'm really sorry for the trouble my wife had caused you. I don't know how to apologize. At the beginning of the call, Betty's husband apologized to me. According to him, Betty had started going to the casino with her friends, and got hooked after winning big with her beginner's luck. At first, he had hoped she would lose interest and quit, but instead, she began to dip into their living expenses when she ran out of her own savings. This led to a fight, and she had returned to her parents' home, and now he found out that she had also taken my money. He was utterly disappointed in my sister-in-law. Thus, both my mother-in-law and Betty's husband came to support me. It would have been best if they were present during the discussion, but since I had already blocked my debit card, it was only a matter of time before my husband found out. As a result, I decided to have a talk with him that night. After the children went to bed, I approached my husband who was watching TV in the living room. I need to talk to you. Hey, what's up now? Is it about my sisters again? Instead of answering, I put the bank book of my savings from before marriage on the table. I was going to send a gift to my friend, but I noticed that my debit card is missing. Do you know anything about it? Are you accusing me of stealing your card? As he said this, my husband had a guilty look on his face. Seeing this, I was certain that he was the culprit. Take a look. The amount of my savings has been decreasing since the day you brought Betty and Tina here. 
It looks like you guys used it. What's going on? You're the one who took them in without consulting me, right? Didn't you say you'll cover their expense on your own? In response, my husband snapped back. Hey, it's just borrowing some money from our joint account, right? We're a family, so we're supposed to help each other out. I'm disappointed you're so heartless. If you want to argue, let's get a divorce. I've been waiting for you to say that. Huh? It might not be a crime to steal money within a family or a married couple, but it's a different story if we're getting a divorce. The money you guys spend is from my personal savings account, not from our joint account. Since we're getting a divorce, I'll have you pay back the amounts you guys spent. What? Wait, you're joking, right? Calm down. I won't wait. You bringing up divorce just to have things go your way? That's called emotional abuse. We're getting divorced, and I'm also going to demand compensation for all of your abusive behavior so far. My husband argued, but the next day, I packed my belongings and returned to my parents' home. Afterwards, I proceeded to handle the divorce through my attorney. My husband ended up burdened with substantial debts due to the division of assets, compensation for emotional abuse, and repayment of spent savings. On top of this, he has to pay child support until our two children turn 18. His sister, Betty, also received a divorce notice from her husband, citing her reckless spending. She is being sued for compensation as well. Tina, his younger sister, was sued in a civil court for continuously ignoring complaints from her neighbors. The three of them, in desperation, went to their mother pleading. Mom, please help us. You guys have the nerve to come back? I've never seen such disappointing children. We're severing our ties today. Never show your faces to me again. But, Mom... Cut off even by their own mother, my ex-husband and his sisters were cornered and at a loss. I returned to my parents' home and my son transferred to a kindergarten around here. While my mother took care of my daughter, I started working. Just as I was getting used to my new job, my ex-husband, Betty and Tina, came to my parents' home, begging for money and asking to let them move in with us. All three of them came together once every two or three days. Of course I avoided meeting them in person. They all pleaded over the intercom, Please keep this between us and don't tell mom and the others. Worried of getting into another trouble, I recorded the intercom footage and also took videos with my phone. I compiled these video files and sent them to their mother, my former mother-in-law. I added a note. They're still coming after us. I hope you can do something about them. From my former mother-in-law, I received only an apology and a promise that she would take care of it. She was enraged, so I'm guessing all three of them had a rough time with her coming after them. Also, their betrayal of each other came to light, which would probably lead to their downfall. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. As for me, while I may have my children feeling lonely at times, our living conditions have definitely improved. I can afford my own things and I am able to live and enjoy my life now. My children are emotionally more stable than when we lived with my ex-husband and his siblings, so I'm glad we got a divorce. From now on, I will continue to cherish this peaceful life I have now.